Hi, welcome to my channel. So since the last couple of videos, I have been talking about nuclear detectors. So what are nuclear detectors? Nuclear detectors are special instruments that can detect nuclear particles like alpha particles, beta particles, gamma radiation, neutrons, protons, etc. and also determine the energy and other such parameters of those particles. Now one very common way in which many of the nuclear detectors works is like this. When an external particle enters a material medium, then through some mechanism the material medium absorbs the energy of the incident particle and converts it into a current pulse and by studying the current pulse by looking at the size of the current pulse we can get an idea about the energy of the incident radiation now the detector that we are going to discuss today also works on a similar kind of a mechanism so today's detector is the scintillation detector so i'm going to talk about the construction as well as the principle and working mechanism of a scintillation detector So here I have drawn a very simple diagram to represent the basics of a scintillation detector. So as you can see the scintillation detector mainly consists of two main parts. The first is a scintillator material and the second is a photomultiplier tube. All right. So let me talk about each of them. So the first what is a scintillator? A scintillator is a special kind of a material medium in which if a charged particle enters it basically absorbs that energy of the charged particle and leads to the creation of light. So this is known as scintillation. So scintillation is the property of a material medium that when an external charged particle enters then it absorbs that energy and leads to the emission of light. How does that happen? So basically when some external nuclear particle enters a scintillator medium, then the external nuclear particle let's suppose an alpha particle is entering the medium, then it basically collides with the molecules of the material medium and every time a collision happens it transfers energy to the material medium. Now the electrons in the material medium which are in the valence band absorb that energy and jump to the conduction band and every time the electrons jump back from the conduction band to the valence band it emits a particular photon so every time this kind of a de excitation happen a particular photon is emitted so basically what happens is that the material medium absorbs the energy of the incident particle and converts it into low energetic photons now different kinds of scintillation detectors use different kind of scintillator medium for example a scintillator made of cesium iodide is used to detect protons and alpha particle while sodium iodide is used to detect gamma radiation and zinc sulfide is used for the detection of alpha particles so the job of the scintillator is very simple when an external alpha particle or a gamma radiation enters the material medium it basically converts the energy of that external particle into low energetic photons greater the energy of the incident radiation larger will be the number of photons created now all of these photons is focused into a photocathode so what is a photocathode the photocathode is simply a material that can experience photoelectric effect what is photoelectric effect so whenever some kind of a incident photons falls onto a metal surface then if the energy of the photons is sufficient enough then electrons are ejected from the metal surface this is photoelectric effect So some kind of a photocathode material is placed on top of a photomultiplier tube. So when all of these light photons which were created as an incident particle enters the scintillator, now these light photons are focused onto the photocathode which result in photoelectric effect and the emission of photoelectrons or primary photoelectrons. Now these primary photoelectrons enter the photomultiplier tube. Now what is the purpose of a photomultiplier tube? The purpose is very simple. It simply needs to increase the initial photoelectrons to a very high value so that it can lead to some sort of a significant current pulse in the electronics connected to this particular system. How does it do that? It does it in a very simple manner. So there is a particular geometrical construction inside the photomultiplier tube. So as you can see, when the light photons came and hit the photocathode, it led to the emission of photoelectrons and these photoelectrons are now directed towards a particular electrode. So this electrode is at plus 100 volt. Now as you can see here these curved surfaces basically all represent electrodes and they are known as dynodes. So there is a particular reason why every single one of these electrode is shaped like this. So initially when the photoelectrons were emitted by the photocathode they were directed towards the first dynode. Now when the electrons reach this particular dynode and strike the surface of the dynode then every time the electron strikes the surface of the dynode it also leads to emission of secondary photoelectrons so let's suppose the one electron strikes the surface of a dynode then that leads to the ejection of a secondary photoelectron which is now directed towards 
another dynode or the second dynode. All right, so as you can see here, the first dynode is at a potential of 100 volt, while the second dynode is at a potential of plus 200 volt. Now, when the photoelectrons hit the first dynode, they lead to ejection of secondary photoelectrons, and these photoelectrons are not directed towards the second dynode. And since there is a potential difference between both these two dynodes, and there is going to be an electric field, so that the electrons are now accelerated towards the second dynode itself. So every time these photoelectrons strike a particular dynode, they lead to the emission of secondary photoelectrons. Now when the secondary photoelectrons reach the second dynode, again the same thing happens. With every single collision, a large number of secondary photoelectrons are emitted. So here again, you will end up getting a large number of photoelectrons which are, are now directed towards the third dinode because there is a potential difference of 100 volt between them. So if I complete this diagram, you end up seeing that at every step, the total number of secondary photoelectrons keeps on increasing. So as you can see here, the effect of this construction is an exponential increase in the total number of photoelectrons. So initially, the primary photoelectrons were ejected from the photocathode when light photons hit this particular material and they were directed towards the first electrode. Now every time the photoelectron hits this surface, it also leads to the emission of photoelectrons. The number of photoelectrons now increases. They are now directed towards the second dynode because there is a potential difference. The, these electrons are accelerated. When they strike the second dynode, they again lead to the emission of more secondary electrons. So there is a cumulative increase in the total number of electrons. They again are directed towards the third dynode which are again directed towards the fourth the fifth and on and on and with every step the total number of photoelectrons are increasing and there is a cumulative increase in the total number of photoelectrons so finally when the total number of electron reaches this particular anode which is connected to some sort of an electronic system then there is a huge amount of current pulse associated with it so as you now realize the construction of this entire setup is just meant to increase a few number of electrons to a huge number number of electrons so as to have a significant current pulse. Now the size of the current pulse which is detected by some sort of an electronic setup is basically dependent on the incident number of primary photoelectrons. Now the primary photoelectrons are created because of light photons. Every single light photon creates one primary electron. So the primary electrons are basically dependent upon the number of light photons and the number of light photons as I already told you are dependent on the energy of the incident nuclear particle. So in a way, the size of the current pulse created here is dependent upon the energy of the incident nuclear particle. So by studying the current pulse, you can get an idea about the energy of the nuclear particle which entered this particular material medium. So a scintillation detector is very effective in telling us about the energy of an incident particle as well as in telling us about the intensity of incident particles. So I hope you have understood the gist of how these kind of detectors work. An incident nuclear particle creates scintillation inside a scintillating material which basically leads to emission of photons. These photons goes towards a photocathode which basically leads to photoelectric effect and the emission of photoelectrons. These photoelectrons are directed towards an electrode where when they hit the surface they lead to ejection of large number of secondary electrons. They are again directed towards another electrode which is at a higher potential thus increasing kinetic energy of the electron and creating further secondary electrons when they hit the surface which are again directed to another electrode which are again directed to another electrode thereby increasing the total number of electrons so that we can observe some kind of a signal current pulse associated with this nuclear particle. So that is the general sort of a working principle and mechanism of a scintillation detector. That's it for today. Thank you very much.